In this following video, I'd like to discuss how when faced with a posterior capsular rupture in a patient with a polar cataract, what are the various surgical steps that we can perform that can prevent the herniation of vitreous, thereby preventing a vitreous loss and helping us retain an intact hyaloid phase. Let's move to watching this surgery. This is a patient with a classic polar cataract and a very early nucleosclerosis. Medical care must be taken while creating the 2.8 tunnel as well as the sideboard tunnel. They should be in the perfect location and of the width just adequate to perform all the maneuvers. Staining the anterior capsule is another important step. We always should be able to identify the anterior capsule should you ever need to use it for a sulcus placement of a three-piece IOL in such cases. Following the introduction of a viscoelastic to flatten the anterior capsule, a central 5.5 mm capsular rexis is performed. It should be of this size because it allows for ease of removal of the nucleus as well as the placement of a three-piece IOL should it be required. The next step is the hydrodelineation. In order to successfully perform this, the hydrocannula is buried into the substance of the nucleus and a jet of fluid injected. This brings about the delineation of the endonucleus without disturbing the epinucleus in the cortex and minimizing the risk of creating a posterior capsular rupture during this step. We now move to the nucleus emulsification. It is an extremely soft cataract and the plan is to just hold on to the endonucleus, bring it up and aspirate it. Almost no energy would be used in aspirating this nucleus. The settings would be something like a power of about 20% a flow rate of 25 cc per minute and a vacuum of 300 millimeters of mercury. Now despite the optimal settings you could see it was a little bit of a struggle to hold on to this very soft nucleus and bring it up. With care, caution and a little bit of patience you will be able to do so. The next and extremely important step is performing the viscofluid exchange. Prior to the removal of the source of irrigation from the eye, at each step, which could be either the phaco probe or the irrigation of the irrigation aspiration, a viscofluid exchange should be performed to prevent a shallowing of the anterior chamber, which would then prevent the posterior capsule from coming anteriorly and further minimize the chances of it opening up. With the endonucleus now emulsified, we now perform a viscodissection of the epinucleus. This brings the epinucleus into the anterior plane, whereby it can be very safely aspirated. Upon the completion of the epinucleus removal, once more watch how a viscofluid exchange is performed to prevent a shallowing of the anterior chamber. Once the viscoelastic insufflates the anterior chamber, the probe is then removed from the eye. The next step is the bimanual irrigation aspiration. To start with, the left side of the cortex is first removed, following which, a viscofluid exchange is performed, the hands swapped over and then the right side of the cortex will be removed. This is what you will see in this part of the video. Upon removal of this last part of the cortex, this is what I saw. There was a classic spindle-shaped tear of the polar cataract underlying it. Now let's see what are the steps we need to take now that we've identified an open posterior capsule in this polar cataract. So the first thing that we need to do is do not bring your instruments out of the eye. You remove the aspiration cannula and perform a viscofluid exchange prior to removing the irrigation probe from the eye. This would prevent the vitreous from prolapsing forwards. Following the viscofluid exchange, the irrigation is removed from the eye. When we visualize the posterior capsular rupture now, we can see that there's no splaying open of the ends of the PCR, suggesting that the vitreous phase is still intact. A dispersive viscoelastic is now injected again into the anterior chamber. The introduction of a dispersive viscoelastic would further prevent the vitreous prolapse. I'd like you to watch now how, with care and caution, the rest of the cortex is removed. The irrigation port should always be facing the angle. 
This would prevent the vitreous from getting hydrated and would further reduce the chances of a vitreous prolapse. With care and caution, I'm able to complete the cortex removal, after which a dispersive viscoelastic is used to perform a viscofluid exchange. You can see now that despite noticing a rent halfway through the bimanual irrigation aspiration, without disturbing any of the vitreous, we were able to remove the entire cortex. We now proceed to watching the loading, followed by the insertion of the three-piece IOL in the ciliary sulcus. It is loaded optimally under direct visualization under the microscope. The leading haptic is brought forward close to the tip. At this point, it's important to visualize the position of the anterior tip of the leading haptic. This would help you understand the manner in which you need to rotate the cartridge prior to the injection of the IOL so that it comes out in the correct position over the anterior capsular edge inferiorly. Adequate dispersive viscoelastic is introduced into the anterior chamber and then we proceed to the IOL insertion. The main incision is enlarged to a 3.2 mm, after which the IOL is inserted. Let's watch the IOL insertion. The second instrument affords counter pressure. We have to ensure at every point of this step that we do not lose any viscoelastic because shallowing of the anterior chamber here would again allow for a vitreous prolapse. It's imperative that the leading haptic should find its place in the ciliary sulcus. Following the introduction of some more viscoelastic into the anterior chamber to deepen it, the trailing haptic is then introduced into the anterior chamber and rotated into its position in the ciliary sulcus with the help of a ball tiler hitched at the inferior optic haptic junction. Notice that even up to now, there is no disturbance in the orientation of the PCR. In an attempt to reorient the haptics with respect to the PCR, I rotate the IOL. But unfortunately, the lower haptic now slips out into the anterior chamber. Under adequate viscoelastic, it is furthermore rotated into the right position in the ciliary sulcus. Watch that in this part of the video. Once the IOL is stabilized in the ciliary sulcus, we now proceed to performing a posterior optic capture, wherein the edges of the optic are just slid under the anterior capsular edge. We now come to the penultimate step, which is the removal of the excess viscoelastic from the anterior chamber. No excessive movements of the IOL are performed here because you've got a well-stabilized IOL with the haptics in the ciliary sulcus and the optics under the anterior capsular edge. With care and caution, the viscoelastic is removed from the anterior chamber, the irrigation still then maintained in the eye, the aspiration cannula removed, and then you can see the stromal hydration is being performed. Finally, the irrigation cannula is removed and the irrigation port also hydrated. This brings us to the end of the case and we've got a stable end result with an IOL well within the ciliary sulcus, a stable posterior capsular rupture and no vitreous disturbance. I hope you found this useful. Thank you.